Hello Viva Musical fans and greetings from this side of the Atlantic in sunny Ireland and thank you for tuning into this, the fourth video blog about this new piece, Sonnets of Dark Love. So I'm well into composing this piece uh, at this point and I thought today it could be interesting to talk about some of the questions one necessarily asks when writing a piece like this. That is, the questions that spur the creative process on that help form musical material and then shaping that material into a fully fledged piece of music. When reading poetry with the intention of setting it to music, I think it's crucially important to carefully consider the difference between one poem or what it would be to write one song versus all of these poems together as a collection or what it would be to write a song cycle and for me it prompts the questions first of all why are these poems whatever number of poems to be experienced collectively um, and I mean that in reference to what they actually discuss and secondly, secondly what are the technical means that connect all of these poems together and Bearing these things in mind um, obviously impact on the way that you consider setting them to music and, and making songs. So you can't read one song or read one poem and think how does this become one song in isolation of all of the other ones. You have to consider it holistically. The answers to a number of these questions are already provided by Lorca in his poetry. The Sonnets of Dark Love are as such a collection um, by virtue of their subject matter. All 11 of these poems explore slightly different aspects of one experience, and that experience being a love affair that Lorca had towards the end of his life. And there are symbols and images and themes and even words that recur throughout all 11 poems running through them like a thread tying them together and um, as such they have to be experienced collectively and that's why they are a collection. So in much the same way that Lorca provides answers to the question why, as in why do we understand these collection of poems as a collection and ergo why we would understand a collection of songs as a song cycle. He also provides answers to questions how and by how I mean in what ways or what are the technical means that he connects all of these poems together and what technical musical means could one draw threads throughout all of these songs thus making it a song cycle. And there's a particular fervour in Lorca's late poetry and indeed in these sonnets that seem to set, stem from the tension between opposites. So there's a Lorca scholar called Paul Binding who uses Freudian terms to explain this. He uses the Freudian terms um, eros and thanatos. Eros being the instinct for love, life, joy and thanatos being the instinct for death aggression, pain. And he suggests there's a constant interplay between these two instincts in Lorca's poetry, and in particular these, these sonnets. So, for example, in Nights of Sleepless Love, which is the last sonnet in the Eleven, you will find the symbol of the moon contrasted with the symbol of the sun. Darkness and night are contrasted with light and dawn, or the poet's... Um, the poet's the poet's uh, cries are contrasted with his lover's laughter, and in as much and I mean there are themes like this running through out all eleven of the poems. So, for example, the symbol of the moon and the sun happens in at least three or four of these poems, and the challenge I've set myself is finding musical analogues to these symbols, themes, um, words, etc. that then form ways of 
drawing musical connections between all of the songs. And it's not necessarily in a sort of motif or a leitmotif kind of way, um, but sort of more juxtapositions of different types of musical languages. So, or the, not so much languages, but the way the music speaks to you. So, for example, you have long, sustained, sort of um, relative, relatively tranquil piano lines um, that are contrasted by sharp outbursts, aggressive um, outbursts. Or you'd have contrasting tessituras, so something that happens very low in an instrument is contrasted with something happening very, very high in another. I've been really fortunate to work with a number of, well, two fluent Spanish speakers, um, VM's Virgil Rash, who I'm sure you all know, and also a composer friend of mine uh, named Rubens Ascanar, who's a native Spanish speaker. And um, it's been great that they've been able to give me so much help on the rhythm of the language. And I've gotten really nice recordings that are useful sort of composing aids of their readings of these poems uh, and also from giving me a sort of more subtle understanding of the words that I couldn't get from translations alone. So um, and obviously that's really important in the sense that it gives you a clearer understanding of what the poems are about and how you could interpret them. Um, but in a sort of less obvious way it's incredibly important in that it sort of prompts a greater diversity of sort of potential music ways of setting them in music uh, when you have a sort of deeper understanding of what the words mean. So for example one very good case is the difference between the words erida and yagas. Erida spelled h-e-r-i-d-a a Spanish word meaning wound as in you stab me and I have a wound and it's one of those symbols that runs throughout a number of the poems and it's actually one of the, the symbols that I found a musical anal analogue to. Um, but there's another word, uh, yagas, which in translations also comes up as wounds. But the difference is quite subtle and there's no um, direct correlation to it in English. We don't have a word for it. It's not just a wound in the physical sense or the emotional sense, but both at the same time. So the closest... A idea we might have to it is is the stigmata, and um, the interesting thing about understanding these words is that when you have one simple musical image for 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 that word, and you want to use the same musical image or symbol when referencing a yagas, there's something extra needed, some heightening in the sort of or intensification in the music when you're actually setting the word Yagas. And so that's one of a number of examples that I thought you might find interesting about the actual language of the Spanish words. So thank you for listening and I hope you found it interesting. I thought uh, a nice way to sign off this video blog would be to play you a short extract from a piece that Lorca has written himself both the music and the text, which has been really helpful and instructive for me in understanding potential ways of setting his verse.